Greetings and salutations, today we will be covering the strange demise of Paul Bren. Born on December 3rd, 1889, Paul Bren, originally Paul Levy, was a German who emerged as a prominent American film director, screenwriter, and producer, making his mark under the banner of Metro Goldwyn Meyer. However, his life took a sinister turn that even some of the most skilled investigators seem to struggle to unravel. At MGM, Paul Bren would eventually assume the pivotal role of assistant to Irving Thalberg, a man of influence and power in the world of cinema. Notably, it was within the studio walls that he played a crucial part in propelling the career of the legendary Jean Harlow, a woman who he would eventually marry in July of 1932. However, just two months after their union, tragedy would strike like a bolt of lightning. Paul Bren's life was abruptly cut short when he was discovered lifeless, a victim of a firearm wound. Nearby lay the implement which ended his life, suggesting the tragedy may have been self-inflicted. Yet as years would go on, the veil of mystery shrouding this case would start to lift, as alternative theories emerged, casting doubt on the official narrative. To go into further detail, Paul Bren originally known as Paul Levy, was born in Winsbrek, a town in the Prussian province of Schleswig-Holstein on December 3rd, 1889. He was the offspring of Julius and Harriet Levy, a Jewish couple who were in search of a better life, and whose journey led them across the Atlantic to the shores of the United States. Julius, Paul's father, initially toiled as a clerk for a shipping company before venturing into the confectionery trade. However, Levy's family would continue to suffer from constant hardships, ultimately driving them to settle in the bustling metropolis of New York City. However, their struggles were far from over. In 1908, tragedy would strike as Julius Levy would pass away, leaving the family to face an uncertain future. Paul Bren, amidst the tumultuous time of his upbringing, would find solace in work on the stage. His aspirations led him to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, where he honed his talent. However, the limelight was not his true calling, and he soon gravitated towards the behind-the-scenes intricacies of theater production, a shift which brought him to Hollywood's luminous embrace in the early 1920s. Initially, he toiled as a film editor, but his ambitions knew no bounds, and with unwavering determination, he ascended the ranks, eventually etching his name into the annals of United Artists and Paramount Pictures as a scenario writer and director. His journey culminated in his illustrious tenure as a producer at Metro Goldwyn Meyer, the preeminent studio of the era. Paul Bren would soon find himself in the orbit of Irving Thalberg, a titan of the silver screen, and it was here that Bren's star began to rise. As he ascended from the role of production assistant to a producer in his own right, their collaborative masterpiece, Grand Hotel, illuminated the silver screen after Bren's untimely demise. This cinematic gem clenched the coveted Best Picture Award at the Academy Awards for the year 1931 through 1932. Yet the honor eluded Bren as he had already shuffled off the mortal coil. In the midst of life's complications, Bren had shared his existence with a common law wife, Dorothy Millett, known in her earlier years as Adele Roddy. Their relationship began its course in 1911 and was marked by Bren's financial support as Millett grappled with mental and emotional turmoil. Tragically, she found her demise in September 19. 1932. She journeyed to Los Angeles, where she had allegedly visited Bren on the fateful night of her passing. But the chilling tale takes an even darker turn, as her lifeless body was discovered in the Sacramento River just days after her mysterious death, which was linked to a harrowing leap from the Delta King theme boat. On September 5th, 1932, those who knew Bren would awake to a haunting discovery. The lifeless body of the MGM executive was sprawled before a gilded mirror in the master bedroom of his opulent Beverly Hills mansion with a single bullet wound to his head. It was noted that the room was permeated with his wife's favorite perfume. And who was this infamous spouse, one might ask? Well, it was none other than Jean Harlow, a rising star 
born Harleen Carpenter in Kansas City, Missouri. Her journey to stardom had been a tumultuous one at that. She had arrived in Los Angeles alongside her then husband, Charles McGrew. However, fame would prove to be elusive until their marriage crumbled, which was the turning point that allowed her to clinch the lead role in the talky remake of Hell's Angels, catapulting her into the limelight. With her trademark platinum blonde hair and daring decotage, Harlow became a sensation. The Los Angeles Times would dub her as Sex Quist and gossip columns would chronicle her every move. It would appear that when receiving attention, Jean Harlow would flourish, strategically aligning herself with Hollywood elite producers and directors. Yet it was Paul Bren who wielded the power to elevate her career to its zenith. He would orchestrate the purchase and transfer of her contract from Howard Hughes to the powerhouse MGM studio. This would be the movement that would break the starlet out of obscurity and plunge her into the deep end of the unforgiving world of cinema. Their whirlwind romance saw Bren proposing after mere months of courtship, culminating in a hasty wedding on July 2nd, 1932, where Harlow notably wore no traditional wedding gown. The ceremony was held at Harlow's mother's residence, and it was a hastily arranged affair. Astonishingly, the newlyweds returned to work just a day later, but the union was apparently a facade of happiness, which concealed an ominous reality. While Harlow radiated joy, Bren's countenance withered and he morphed into a pallid, haunted version of himself within weeks of their nuptials. Whispers and rumors began to swirl. Speculation mounted, some suggesting the couple's troubles stemmed from the grand home Bren had purchased in Benedict Canyon, the two-story Bavarian-style mansion nestled within a spacious five-acre estate in Beverly Hills, would become the backdrop for their turbulent story. Intriguingly, it was reported that Harlow harbored a distaste for this lavish dwelling, desiring its sale nearly from the onset, while Bren clung to the dream of building their life together there, and things would only come back around in the year 1932. A mere four months following his marriage to the illustrious Jean Harlow, Bren's lifeless body would be found thralled before a full-length mirror in the all-white bedroom, the air heavy with the fragrance of his wife's cherished perfume. He was found nude and vulnerable. It would be noted that his demise was swift. A 38 caliber revolver was found lying unceremoniously at his side. But what truly defies explanation is the cryptic note he would leave behind. Nestled on a side table, bearing the words, Dearest Dear, Unfortunately, this is the only way to make good the frightful wrong I have done you, and wipe out my object humiliation. I love you, Paul. You understand that last night was only a comedy. Things would become curiouser and more curiouser, as it was the butler who made the first call once the body was found. However, rather than dialing the authorities, he called the studio where Bren worked at. Studio heads, the people with the largest amount of power, in Hollywood would quickly respond with an astounding urgency. Apparently, the police would not be notified during the initial critical moments of the body being found. In the surreal interval that followed, MGM co-founder Louis B. Mayer joined fellow studio executives W.P. Hendry and Irving Thalberg as they descended upon Bren's residence. What transpired in those two perplexing hours prior to the police investigation remains unknown to all. Of particular interest is Meyer's decision to retain Bren's enigmatic note. While his intentions remain murky, the studio eventually guided him to handing it over to law enforcement. The investigators scoured the note but they found themselves lost for clues. Then they would turn their attention to Jean Harlow, the bride. The question as to why she had not spent the night at home with her husband was quickly raised, and authorities would be met with rather suspicious resistance. Harlow's physician cited her as being too hysterical to undergo questioning at the time. This explanation would later raise eyebrows. While she did eventually speak to authorities, her conspicuous absence as a witness during the inquest added another layer of intrigue into the investigation. However, authorities were able to surmise that Bren had dispatched Harlow to spend the evening with her mother. Curiously, she returned on Sunday, but was swiftly sent away once more by Bren, citing that he needed to read scripts 
As hours passed without a word from her husband, Harlow merely assumed that he had fallen asleep. However, there is another narrative that suggests she sought solitude due to a headache, returning to her mother's residence for respite. This did raise a question. If Bren had not shared the night with his wife prior to his demise, what is the meaning of the phrase, you understand last night was only a comedy? This line from Bren's final note raised a litany of doubts, and it would go unaddressed by authorities. Yet, despite the unanswered questions, the path of least resistance was chosen, and the verdict of self-termination was stamped on the case. While officially ruled a self-termination, those in Bren's inner circle believed it was not, but rather they proposed it was murder. Accounts from Bren's associates painted a starkly contrasting picture from the official narrative. Davis, Bren's gardener held firm in his conviction that this was a murder from the very beginning. He cast doubt on the butler's accounts of events, asserting that the butler had misled police. According to Davis, the butler had depicted a passionate and affectionate relationship between Bren and Jean Harlow, one punctuated by decisions of self-termination. Yet, Davis claims that the portrayal was entirely false. In his view, the couple's relationship was far from harmonious, and he had never heard Bren utter thoughts of self-destruction. Furthermore, Davis expressed skepticism regarding the authenticity of the self-termination note, believing it was unrelated to his employer's handwriting. Irene Henson, Bren's secretary, concurred with David's account. She added a curious layer to this narrative by suggesting that it was Harlow, not Bren, who had pursued their relationship with fervor. Harrison also noted that Bren did not appear particularly content during the reception after the wedding ceremony. However, the most interesting intriguing testimony came from Winifred Carmichael, Bren's cook. Her revelations painted an eerie tableau. She stated that on the fateful Sunday evening, the household staff had glimpsed a mysterious woman within the confines of Bren's residence. A voice unfamiliar to the cook had echoed throughout the halls, punctuated by a singular chilling scream. What was more, she discovered a damp woman's bathing suit at the pool's edge, accompanied by two empty glasses nearby. This caused the tantalizing question to arise in the eyes of many investigators the thought that this mysterious woman could have been Dorothy Millet became solidified and there was also the question if Harlow's presence is confirmed at her mother's home during this time frame who else other than Dorothy could have been the guest in Bren's home strangely enough no records exist that even claim that the police dusted the glasses for fingerprints nor was the mysterious bathing suit taken into custody Intriguingly, it was confirmed that the bathing suit was indeed wet and curiously enough, it did not match Harlow's size. Additionally, claims surfaced regarding the presence of blood near the pool. Members of Bren's household staff attested to this fact, yet these accounts were never officially substantiated by the authorities, almost as if the testimonies were intentionally disregarded. The case of the death of Paul Bren presents itself with a tapestry of theories, each more cryptic than the last. The first theory veers towards the notion of Bren's self-termination. It paints a bleak picture of a man ensnared in the web of his dazzling life. Yet a demanding new wife, Jean Harlow, had increased the pressure on the man who was allegedly on the brink of financial ruin, leading Bren to face mounting pressures which supposedly had sprung relentless quarrels over money throughout the couple's brief marriage. The question that arises is whether the financial woes became insurmountable. However, this theory is not favored by many due to just how recently the couple had gotten married, meaning the pressure for self-termination likely would not have had time to build up to such an extent. An alternative theory insists that Harlow herself was the perpetrator of Bren's demise directly, her potential motives ranging from jealousy stemming from Bren's lingering love for Dorothy Millett to his purportedly lackluster performance as a husband. In this narrative, his self-termination note takes an entirely different hue, casting it as an apology note rather than a farewell. According to this theory, studio executives, mindful of their public image, concealed the true nature of Bren's death in order to protect both the studio's reputation and their investment in Harlow's own. Expanding on this theory, Harlow knew of Millet's existence, and some would go on to report that she was plagued by jealousy. 
and suspicion would deepen when considering the alteration to Bren's will. Originally, it designated Millet as the beneficiary with a perpetual monthly payment of $1,200. Yet mere weeks after Bren's marriage to Harlow, the will would undergo a drastic transformation, bequeathing the entirety of the estate to the new bride. The timing of this alteration raises eyebrows and fuels the suspicions of many. Another theory proposes that Millette herself committed murder self-termination, driven by the spirit at her confinement in a mental institution and her perception of Bren's newfound happiness with Harlow. This theory raises a macabre question. If Harlow had been present that fateful evening, would both she and Bren have met their tragic ends together? Another rather audacious theory proposes that Jean Harlow's mother used connections with the mob that she supposedly had to orchestrate Bren's death due to being fed up with her son-in-law's turbulent marriage with her cherished daughter and the scandal surrounding his first wife. And finally, in this labyrinth of alternative theories, we encounter the perspective of Samuel Mrax, a friend and colleague of Bren and Ivan Thalberg at MGM. In his 1990 book, he painted a distinctive narrative of Bren's tragic end. Mrax claimed to have visited Bren's residence in the early hours of September 5th, 1932, prior to the police arriving or even being alerted. There he alleged to have witnessed Thalberg tampering with crucial evidence. Mrax recounted that on the following day, studio executives, including Louis B. Meyer, were informed that the case must be officially ruled as self-termination due to impotence in order to shield Jean Harlow from a career-ending scandal. After closely examining the evidence, Mrax arrived at a startling conclusion. Paul Bren had been murdered by his forsaken common-law wife, Dorothy Millett, who subsequently met a grim end by leaping overboard from the Delta King during her journey from San Francisco to Sacramento. In conclusion, the mysterious death of MGM executive Paul Bren in 1932 remains a mystery that has endured the test of time. Despite the initial ruling of self-termination, subsequent investigations spurred on by doubts raised in the 1960s by screenwriter Ben Hatchett and revelations from film producer Samuel Mrax in 1990 suggest that there may be more to this story than meets the eye. With complex relationships, financial pressures, and allegations of tampering with evidence, the case of Paul Bren's demise continues to intrigue and leaves us with lingering questions about what truly transpired in the shadowed corridors of Hollywood's golden age. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you, and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.